From WNIN News, this is the Friday Wrap. I'm John Gibson. On today's show, we welcome John Martin of Evansville Living to discuss a major economic development project planned for the Boonville area. WNIN's Tim Jagalow will recap his story about a new glass recycling program in Evansville. We'll hear from Indiana Public Broadcasting's Abigail Ruman about the impact of the state's near-total abortion ban after nearly one year. And we'll run down the weekend notebook. The Friday Wrap is next on WNIN-FM with support from Indiana Public Broadcasting stations following the news from NPR. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, a major multi-use development is planned for a location that might surprise you, the outskirts of Boonville. The $74 million Edge of the Lakes project includes plans for a 140-room hotel, residences, an entertainment center, and more. John Martin of Evansville Living and Evansville Business has been writing about the project, and he joins me now. John, as always, thanks for the time. Good to be back, John. It's been a while. Good to have you here. Well, now, I mentioned some of the uh, elements of this project. Uh, Can you share a few more of what we might be looking at here? What the mayor of Boonville announced back in November of last year, John, early November, was that uh, the project, which was then estimated at $74 million, it's it's grown since. They're Mm -hmm. they're now saying it's uh, double that at least. Uh, But he said that the project will involve a hotel with about 140 rooms, fire and police station with training facilities, Mm -hmm. meeting accommodations, and then probably of most use to the general, most interest to the general public, uh, a rather large entertainment district, uh, retail and restaurant spaces, a golf experience, uh, bowling, go-karts, swimming and fishing, all sorts of different uh, wow. different elements. Yeah, now, you say uh, the project apparently has grown to, uh, I guess, more in the neighborhood of $140 million we're talking? 150 or, 150. or thereabouts is, is okay. what has been stated. Now, obviously, this is a big, big project. Do we have a, an idea about how such a project will be funded? To do a project like this, you need two things. You need a lot of financing and a lot of land. And up to this point, uh, the the mayor of Boonville and the companies that are involved have not said a whole lot about that. I can tell Mm -hmm. you that uh, in reporting on the project uh, several weeks after it was first announced by the mayor back in early November, in May, we received an official response from an attorney tied to the project who told us that this is a private initiative. Mm-hmm. Uh, he cited uh, a multitude of investors and businesses who are all contributing in their own ways. And he further stated uh, in response to inquiries that uh, there are non-disclosure agreements, which everybody has signed, which uh, keeps everything on the hush-hush for right, now. I can right. tell you there's... There is a lot of curiosity about it, uh, given the size and the scope of it. Uh, We've basically been told to wait and see, uh, and more information will be forthcoming about the financing in due time. Yeah. Hmm. Now, the uh, the Boonville City Council uh, took action uh, earlier this year uh, for this Edge of the Lakes project, uh, correct? Yes, that's one thing that we do know. The, the Boonville uh, City Council created a tax increment financing district for the for the location of the project, which we should add is in the area, uh, it would be the west side of Boonville near sort the, the Walmart west end. store. Right, right. Mm-hmm. right. And ta- tax increment financing districts are very common uh and that's, per, what, per, and that's what the city council yes uh, created, created a tax right? increment financing district very common mechanism that local governments use to try to leverage funds and advance projects and what they did was create this district in this area what it involves is is borrowing money to uh, and and then paying off the that 
those loans with the property taxes that the, the, the development initially spins off. Right. And about $25 million from this tax increment financing mechanism would be used to basically build out the infrastructure that would be mm-hmm. needed to do a project of this type, not the project itself, but the pre-work, things like utilities, uh, roads, uh, th- those necessary things that would be needed for the construction to start. Sure, sure. Now, um, we mentioned uh, this uh, project is uh, planned for the west end of Boonville. Uh, how did that area, do we have any idea how that uh, location became, <laughs> you know, a location for such a potentially big project? Not really, John. And to be honest with you, it was even the location of it was kind of a mystery at first because mm-hmm. back in November when the mayor uh Charlie Wyatt first announced the project at that time, he didn't even reveal what the location would be other than obviously in the city of Boonville, mm-hmm. but he didn't nail that down. That that information didn't come forth until later. So whether this was the, the preferred site all along or if other sites were considered and then eliminated, I couldn't tell you, but I just know that this is where uh, This is where they say it's going. There are multiple parcels uh, and multiple property owners in that area Mm -hmm. and where uh, where the process of property acquisition stands. I I really don't know. I just know that uh, all along the the mayor and the development representatives have said that the third quarter of 2024 is when we can expect to be a ground uh, see a groundbreaking and okay. we're there yeah we are getting into that uh, third quarter for sure uh we're speaking with john martin of evansville living he also writes for evansville business you can find uh, this story and uh, all of his stories at evansvilleliving.com this is the friday wrap i'm john gibson well john um has it been difficult to get information uh, about this project it seems like it yes mm-hmm. very difficult uh, the, the mayor has not uh granted interviews pertaining to the project really since he announced it back in November. Mm -hmm. He's had uh, not very much to say about it. Uh, We have reached out to uh, the lead development company, which is an outfit in Florida called Heavenly Hands. It's a faith-based organization. Not a whole lot is known about them. They do have a Facebook page and a website. Their Facebook page has not been updated uh, with anything new since late May, Hmm. which is also when we received uh, a letter from an attorney representing the developers. So there's been kind of radio silence since since that time. Hmm. Uh, So in a word, yes, we we have been left in the dark about where things stand uh, really since late May. And even then, we were not told a whole lot other than right. just the general parameters, as we said at the top, uh, of what the project's going to involve. Yeah, yeah. Now, we should probably note, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Boonville mayor uh, announced this. Uh, it was just shortly before Election Day, right? It was, I believe, less than a week before his uh, stood for re-election and, of course, won re-election. Yeah, yeah. And I guess... Uh, one could look at that and say, well, uh, you know, was this a, a perhaps a political uh, uh, announcement, uh, the idea being to, uh, you know, boost uh, his uh, his showing at the polls? All I know is that's when he chose to make the announcement about the project. Yeah, that, that timing uh, certainly uh, certainly makes one, uh, one wonder. Uh, so you say this uh, Florida-based developer, uh, Heavenly Hands Property Services, has not shed any more light on its plans at this point. They have not, and and I've reached out to them uh, requesting interviews and have not been granted one. We did receive, as I said, uh, a letter in May 19th is when we got it from Mm -hmm. an attorney who represents, uh, not sure if it's Heavenly Hands specifically, but the the development entities, either Heavenly Hands or the development entities as a whole, Mm -hmm. and it said what uh, all I can tell you is that he said it's a private initiative, lots of different players involved in it. Uh, he cited non-disclosure agreements, and he did say that, uh, in, I think these are his exact words, at the end of the day, all of this will be an open book. So yeah. we're we're standing by and waiting for that book to get cracked open. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, now, I understand there's also a golf partner in this project. Is that right? Hazards Entertainment is hmm. uh, another Florida company, uh, was presented as being the golf partner. They are promising a an 18 hole experience, and from the sound of it, John, it sounds like it's more than just a typical putt putt type experience, which yeah. many of us have seen. Uh, golf simulators. Uh, they they said it's not just putting, but all, you can also work on chipping, mm-hmm. um, a restaurant element, uh, and a type of thing that it sounds like could be enjoyed by. 
uh, families as well as by adults out for ha- having a good time. Yeah, so, yeah. again, I mean, uh, all, all these things have been promised, and uh, we'll see about when it's delivered. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Waiting for more information. Now, we talked a little bit about, about this location there on the uh, west end of Boonville. And, and speaking of golf, I mean, do, do we think the proximity to uh, the Victoria golf course might be a, uh, you know, might this be a place where, you know, people would uh, would stay or perhaps those two entities could uh, uh, support each other a little bit? Uh, anything's possible. That would be more of a question for the for the. De- the people involved. And anything is possible. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And again, uh, we haven't heard too much from them. I will say that the, the mayor, back when he announced this, made a point of saying that Boonville is in need of more entertainment uh, mm-hmm. type opportunities yeah. for, for the residents there. And uh, he talked about how this would be a transformation, not just the golf element, but the project as a whole would be a transformational thing for Boonville, a town that has fewer than 7,000 people. Right. It's highly ambitious. And uh, again, we're in wait and see mode. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, EREP, the big uh, economic development group here in Southwest Indiana. Uh, what have officials from uh, that group said about this project? Not very much, and a curious thing to me about that, John, is that, of course, Evansville Regional Economic Partnership, EREP, exists for purposes of recruiting economic development and doing economic development projects for the area. Mm -hmm. And on this one, they seem to not really be in the loop on it based Mm -hmm. on their responses when I've asked them about it. Uh, They have not had a whole lot to say other than we're following it. And Ditto, there's another organization called Success Warwick County, which has a similar mission to EREP, and they are part of Warwick County government. They also uh, claim very little little to no involvement in the Hmm. the Edge of the Lakes project. So I should emphasize, though, I mean, none of those are not disqualifiers in any way. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be a project, but those are organizations that for a project of this nature, you would think that they would be involved. Yeah, yeah, and and perhaps they will be eventually, but at this point it seems like uh, they, they don't have much uh, involvement. To my knowledge, no. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, an Evansville-based construction group, I, I understand, has been uh, tied to the project, correct? Trailer Brothers, a news release put out by the uh, – by the developers cited uh, a conversation with Trailer Brothers mm. uh, that they had signed on. Uh, when I reached out to Trailer Brothers to ask about that, uh, they more or less said they are kind of like us, John, waiting on more details to be forthcoming. But if the project takes shape, uh, they would enjoy and welcome a chance to be involved in it. That's yeah. es- essentially what they said. All right. Well, uh, obviously, we're, we are waiting for more information on this. Any idea what the next steps would be? No. Uh, as I say, we're in August now. Uh, the, the official announcement was back in, or the the, the lid lifting of, of the right. uh, the debut of the information was back in early November by the mayor of Boonville, mm-hmm. and we have not heard anything about it since May and sitting here in August. So waiting and seeing, John, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's something that I know uh, – the residents of Boonville and the residents of the region are very curious about. Uh, been a lot of questions asked about it, and uh, very few updates and answers have yeah. been provided of late. That doesn't mean that they yeah. won't be. Sure, but we're we're kind of in 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 a wait and see yeah. frame of mind on it. More, more questions than answers at this point. Uh, well, John, anything else to add uh, regarding your story in Evansville uh, business that we haven't uh, talked about here? It's at EvansvilleLiving.com, and uh, it's available to read. Yes, indeed. That is John Martin of Evansville Living and Evansville Business. You can uh, find this story and others at evansvilleliving.com. John, we'll hope to have you back when we perhaps know more information about this project. Sounds good, John. Anytime. All right. We certainly appreciate you uh, coming across the parking lot from uh, the building next door here. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, That's John Martin. I'm John Gibson. And coming up on the Friday Wrap... For the first time in 11 years, a glass recycling program will be available here in Evansville. WNIN's Tim Jagalow has reported on that, and he will uh, join us uh, to uh, recap that story. That's coming up on the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. Hope you can stay with us.
On All Things Considered, the world is brought to your car radio, smart speaker, and mobile phone. Hi, I'm Kenton McDonald, your local All Things Considered host on 88.3 WNIN. As we spend our afternoons together, enjoy local news, statewide news from Indiana Public Broadcasting, and national and international news from NPR. Join me Monday through Friday, 3 to 7, and thanks for your support. This week on This American Life, so Cameron's in the ocean, and he hears, from maybe 100 yards away, someone yelling, shark. There was really three options. You sit there and panic and scream for somebody else to help, and you don't do anything. Or you swim the opposite way and try to protect yourself. Or the third option, you swim toward the shark. That's what Cameron did. What goes through your head when you make that choice this week? WNIN listeners are business leaders in the community. They're business owners, managers, decision makers, and influencers. Hi, I'm Laura Porter, WNIN's underwriting account executive. Learn how your message can reach that valuable audience. Visit WNIN.org, click on the support tab, and then select corporate support. Or email me at L-P-O-R-T-E-R at WNIN.org. This week on American Roots, it's street beats from tap to rap, boogie to soul, surf to jazz. The late drummer Earl Palmer speaks of playing with Little Richard and Fats Domino. Plus, we'll dig into the clave rhythm with Tom McDermott. And Elvis's man in the pocket, the late DJ Fontana, keeps the beat on American Roots from PRX. Support for WNIN comes from listeners like you and from... Evansville Regional Airport, with nonstop flights to and from Chicago on American Airlines. For travelers planning a business trip to Chicago or connecting to more than 120 one-stop destinations from Evansville via Chicago at aa.com. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, for the first time in 11 years, a glass recycling program will be available for Vandenberg County residents at a facility here in Evansville. WNIN's Tim Jagalo has been following the story, and he filed this report. Uh, oh my, where did you come from? You've been at my house. I know. That's your wife. Yeah. This is your wife. Julie Blevins and Ann Basden are loading the back of a pickup truck with glass for recycling. The pickup bed is full. Most of the items are alcohol containers sorted by color. It's not all theirs, though. Of course, it's a collection for the surrounding Albert Boulevard neighborhood, put on by the association they lead. This load is bound for the recycling facility in Posey County. They'll take... You can see they take the clear, the brown, the blue. So Posey County is nice enough that we can bring it to them. Um, we just have to offload it and take it into their facility. Why make the drive if glass is accepted every week in Evansville? Mary Allen is on the city council and with Zero Waste Evansville. We do not have a way to process and receive and recycle glass. So technically it is still in the contract. So Republic, we have to say that they accept glass because contractually they're obligated to, but about 50 tons, 40 to 50 tons of glass um, is sent through the recycle facility to the landfill Uh currently each month. This isn't news to many city waste customers. In 2012, Allen says the city switched to single stream recycling which is convenient. However, with single stream recycling, we need a lot more infrastructure at our recycle facility to be able to properly process glass to where it's a marketable material and not too contaminated, which is why we need a separate bunker for drop off. And that is what is happening. Starting August 2nd, for the first time in 11 years, there will be a way to actually recycle glass. Vanderbilt County residents can drop all colors of glass into the bin at Tri-State Resource Recovery, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Labels are okay, but it should be clean with no lid. This isn't a city program. It's a partnership with Tri-State Resource Recovery and Recycle Services. All the glass will be sold to Knopf Insulation in Shelbyville to make fiberglass insulation, says Jim Ritchie with Recycle Services. The material that, that we're 
able to collect at a drop-off location like what, what they're starting up in Evansville is, is able to stay in state after it's processed and, and they'll find its finished product made here in the state of Indiana. This is kind of a rare and even fledgling program. Mary Ellen says there's no guarantee for success. There's a lot they don't know. The price of glass fluctuates and transportation is expensive. It's also expensive for Tri-State Resource Recovery to handle glass in the recycling bin as it is. They have to pay to have it hauled off to the landfill. So if we can divert the glass from the recycle bin and deliver it to our recycle facility, that's best case scenario. Otherwise, throw it in your trash. You heard that correctly. It's better to throw glass away if you can't bring it to the facility. Still, Alan is really hoping the community will make the effort. I think people are used to just putting their glass into their single stream recycle bin at home. And so this is going to take some effort. They're going to have to haul their glass down to the recycle center and drop it off. Richie says this is an important project because Indiana as a state is behind with recycling infrastructure. We need to uh, do a better job of, of recycling. Indianapolis recycles, Fort Wayne recycles, but uh, Evansville does not. So it's, it's, this is a very important project. Uh, we've, we've got support from Knopf. We've got, so Mary's got support from, from us, Recycle Services. And, and we're going to work together to, to make this program work. For WNIN News, I'm Tim Jagalo. And Tim joins us live in the studio here. Once again, Tim, thanks for joining us. Happy Friday, John. Happy Friday to you. Well, I believe uh, this uh, glass recycling story, I believe we had it first. Uh, how did you uh, come upon it? Yeah, I never do that, do I? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, was, it started just because um, my wife Emily and I and our daughter Bronwyn were just kind of walking around the neighborhood and uh, walking out at Elver Boulevard, as mm-hmm. we know, it's a very nice place to walk. And, you know, I see this pickup truck full of glass with signs and I knock on the we knock on the neighbor on the 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 homeowner's door and she says oh yeah they're going to come to collect it on Saturday and I thought ah that sounds kind of like I don't know what the story is but it could be interesting I was the story was eventually originally going to be just about grassroots uh glass recycling efforts because we as we know it doesn't really exist in the stream right now right um but then when I talked to Mary Allen who was helpful with their program she said actually hold on this program could be happening um, and this was in early July that we talked. And so mm-hmm. there was, even at that point, they weren't sure it was going to happen. Right. So uh, basically I've been following it since then and, you know, uh, released this story last week. But because recycling starts today, it seems like a good day to yeah. revisit yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, again, this recycling, uh, folks can take their glass to Tri-State Resource and Recovery. That's at uh, Morgan Avenue and Harriet there near uh, Garvin Park. Uh now, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of folks, uh, you know, have been uh, very reluctant to throw their glass bottles or glass of any kind, really, uh, uh, into just the trash. Uh, you know, you'd like it to be recycled. Why has it been so difficult to get uh, glass recycled here in uh, Evansville? It, it just has it has to do with it being single stream. Basically, mm-hmm. when all the glass is together, with well, the glass is with everything else, it gets dirty, and uh, Jim Ritchie says basically you need a facility with the technology to sort the, the glass optically right away, mm-hmm. and so it can be cleaned and, and separated before it gets too dirty with all the other recycling materials. And, um, you know, so basically that's what happens with single stream. It doesn't get pulled out soon enough to be a clean enough com- commodity to sell to make it worth it. Mm-hmm. And also he said something I didn't know, which was that um, some entities will use glass as landfill cover. So instead of it being recycled, it just sits on top of the landfill in order to cover the landfill. I see. And, uh, and, and, and you know, glass is good to recycle because it's infinitely recyclable. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, you can keep recycling it forever uh, and it's cheaper and better, well, hopefully better for the environment, but it's definitely less energy to create, to use recycled glass than to create mm-hmm. new glass. Yeah. Now, uh, let's talk about some previous efforts. I, I believe there have been at least times in which uh, we've uh, recycled glass here in, uh, in Evansville. What are some of those previous efforts that you uh, have looked into? Well, well, prior to 2012, you'd have to tell me what happened in Evansville. I'm not sure if, mm-hmm. if, if you recall if it was recycled legitimately back then. And obviously, the recycling climate has changed a lot in that time right, anyway. Sure. But, uh, you know, um, 
you know, there were the grassroots efforts to take the glass to Mount Vernon in some neighborhoods. Um, also, residents for a time were able to take it to Henderson, Kentucky, because they have a glass crusher. Mm. But um, Mary Allen says they were basically inundated with Evansville glass, and they had to say, sorry, I see. we can't take this anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Mary Allen was part of a she, – she helped orchestrate a, a pilot program where they collected 26,000 pounds of glass over a six-month period, you know, through neighborhoods and through even like a kiosk at the zoo – to kind of, I guess, illustrate the de- the demand that was there for legitimately recycling glass. Sure. Um, you know, and, and also a drop-off, as she said, is really good for businesses because they need to get rid of glass too. Right. You know, you've got you've got bars that use, t- that gather tons of bottles. Yeah, restaurants, bars, all those kinds of uh, businesses, right? Yeah, so, th- so those, that, those are, I guess, a, a short summary of previous efforts um, that have existed in Evansville. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, uh, again, we mentioned uh, folks can start recycling their ga- glass or dropping it off at Tri-State uh, Resource and Recovery today. Uh, is there uh, anything else to add that we haven't touched on here? Well, you know, it's the, the particular bunker that we're talking about is at the corner of Reed and Morgan. Okay. So um, it's just this big, I mean, there's cinder block, not cinder blocks, but just giant block pavers making a bunker bunker in the corner there. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, they accept all colors, um, but it does have to be for food or beverage. Okay. So I don't have an example of what else that could be, but that's <laughs> it has to be for food. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, uh, they need to be rinsed. There can't be any lids, but the labels are okay. And this is, of course, for Vandenberg County residents only. Mm-hmm. Uh, Monday through Friday, Friday, 8 to 3, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And businesses are for Friday only. And, uh, and the way it's going to work is they're going to accrue enough glass to make a load worth carrying, so 20 tons, something like that, 18 to 20 tons, uh, Jim Ritchie said. Mm -hmm. They will gather, and as the glass sits in there, it's also going to get crushed down. I don't Mm -hmm. know if they do it with heavy equipment or just the weight of it, but basically they fill up that bin, and then then it gets collected and uh, gets transported. One thing I will add is that this also helps to consolidate uh, some logistical problems that Knopf Mm-hmm. Uh, insulation had they had to get glass from out of state um, and process it out of state and bring it in and so this will kind of close the loop and keep everything in Indiana yeah yeah so that way your 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 glass bottles your glass containers uh, will uh, become part of insulation mm-hmm. yeah all right well that is WNIN's Tim Jagalo he uh, covered this story about this new glass recycling program here in Vanderburg County Tim as always we appreciate your uh, your your efforts. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you much. Bring your glass. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Have a good weekend. All right. Well, coming up on the Friday Wrap, we'll hear from Indiana Public Broadcasting's Abigail Ruman. She'll tell us about the impact of Indiana's near total abortion ban. It went into effect nearly one year ago now. That story's coming up along with the Weekend Notebook on the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. Imagine you're just walking down the street and someone collapses or you're with someone and they collapse. What would you do in this situation? On the next Radio Lab, cardiac arrest in the U.S. happens 1,000 times every day. Learn how you could be the difference between life, a lot of us just freeze, and death. For all the modern medicine we have, when it comes to this, all we really have is each other. How to save a life. That's on the next Radio Lab. The new movie, Twisters, is terrifying, but nothing compared to the horrors of the Great American Tornado 100 years ago right here in the Tri-State. I'm David James, and on 2 Main Street, we look back at the deadliest twister in U.S. history that roared through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, and the recovery effort that included the search for a tetanus vaccine. 2 Main Street airs Thursday at noon, Saturday at 11, presented by Jeffrey Berger, Kim Wren, and the Berger Wealth Services team at Bayard Private Wealth Management. Sam Bente started working at the Evansville Brew House in Haney's Corner a few months after it opened in 2016. And in 2019, she bought the business that's now known as Haney's Corner Brewing Company. I'm Peggy Pirro, and on the latest episode of the Food From Here podcast, Sam and I talk about community and food and what's happening in the neighborhood and, of course, beer. Food From Here is sponsored by Swerka and more and their intergenerational community garden partnership with Young and Established. 
It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Glad you've joined us for today's program. Well, Indiana's near-total abortion ban went into effect nearly one year ago now, cutting off access for most Hoosiers. Since then, patients have encountered new challenges and barriers to what many providers consider an essential part of OBGYN care. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Abigail Ruman explains how advocates, patients, and providers are navigating access to care under the ban. Jess Marchbank helps run the Hoosier Abortion Fund for All Options Pregnancy Resource Center. For years, she would brace herself every morning before going through applications submitted to the fund. She was used to being overwhelmed by requests for support from people seeking abortions. When the near-total abortion ban took effect, Marchbank expected the volume of requests for help to at least remain consistent. When I logged in on August 1st, and there were no new messages, no applications at all, I didn't feel relieved at all. I felt scared and frustrated. The fund used to receive hundreds of calls each month, but since the ban, it averages just over 100. Marchbank says it's not that fewer people need abortion care, it's that people don't understand the law. They don't know that it's perfectly legal to talk about getting an abortion, to go to another state to get an abortion, to get help getting one. The law only allows abortion care under a few narrow exceptions, but even those are difficult to navigate. Marchbank says when a patient may qualify to receive care in Indiana, in her experience, they tend to proactively choose to go out of state. They may be able to access an abortion that is a like a tiny fraction of the cost and not have to jump through nearly as many of those hoops that they would if they tried to get one in the state. However, getting care out of state comes with its own challenges. For the past year, the fund has had to work with other abortion funds to address the barriers that come with having to travel. And advocates have to deal with different requirements or restrictions depending on where people go for care. It's not just patients and advocates navigating confusion and challenges under the ban. Dr. Caroline Rouse is a maternal fetal medicine specialist at IU Health. She says the law has vague, non-medical language that can be confusing for providers, too. Patients' ability to have health care is made a lot more difficult when it's not just me and the patient in the exam room, it is also the legislature of the state of Indiana. Some hospital systems have created specific resources to help providers make these difficult considerations around care. For the IU Health System, this is where the rapid response team comes in. It is available to clinicians within IU Health who have a question that requires immediate response for a patient sitting in front of them. If a provider is unsure if something qualifies as a legal abortion, they can reach out, even if the question isn't urgent. The team includes representatives from the system's clinical, legal, and ethics teams. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Rouse is one of the clinical responders. She says the team offers providers answers around what's allowed under the law and IU Health policy. As complete a response as one can have in the setting of a law that, again, is very, very vague and non-medical. For providers, these resources can help them give patients the best care that's allowed under the law. But that doesn't eliminate the fear entirely. Rouse says people have declined offers to work in her division. Moving to a state where there are criminal penalties um, for providing evidence-based reproductive health care is not something that a lot of people want to entertain. That affects more than just access to abortion care. Dr. Julie Tillman is the vice chair of the Indiana American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She says Indiana already has a shortage of providers, and this law makes it harder to maintain the state's workforce. We're seeing fewer residents that are training in Indiana, and then we're also seeing subsequently fewer people are sticking around in Indiana. Many of them are choosing to practice outside of Indiana once they graduate. In addition, Tillman says some existing providers are dropping the obstetrics part of their practice or leaving the state entirely. This abortion ban is really having a severely negative effect on our workforce in Indiana, but we're doing the best that we can right now. It may take some time before the data reflects the full impact of the near-total ban. For now, providers and advocates continue to connect people to the care they need, despite the challenges created by the law. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Abigail Ruman. It is the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Coming up next, it's the Weekend Notebook on your public radio station, WNIN-FM.
On All Things Considered, the world is brought to your car radio, smart speaker, and mobile phone. Hi, I'm Kenton McDonald, your local All Things Considered host on 88.3 WNIN. As we spend our afternoons together, enjoy local news, statewide news from Indiana Public Broadcasting, and national and international news from NPR. Join me Monday through Friday, 3 to 7, and thanks for your support. WNIN listeners are business leaders in the community. They're business owners, managers, decision makers, and influencers. Hi, I'm Laura Porter, WNIN's underwriting account executive. Learn how your message can reach that valuable audience. Visit WNIN.org, click on the support tab, and then select corporate support. Or email me at L-P-O-R-T-E-R at WNIN.org. This week on American Roots, it's street beats from tap to rap, boogie to soul, surf to jazz. The late drummer Earl Palmer speaks of playing with Little Richard and Fats Domino. Plus, we'll dig into the clave rhythm with Tom McDermott. And Elvis's man in the pocket, the late DJ Fontana, keeps the beat on American Roots from PRX. Sam Bente started working at the Evansville Brew House in Haney's Corner a few months after it opened in 2016. And in 2019, she bought the business that's now known as Haney's Corner Brewing Company. I'm Peggy Pirro, and on the latest episode of the Food From Here podcast, Sam and I talk about community and food and what's happening in the neighborhood and, of course, beer. Food From Here is sponsored by Swerka and more and their intergenerational community garden partnership with Young and Established. Support for WNIN comes from listeners like you and from Evansville Regional Airport with nonstop flights to and from Chicago on American Airlines. For travelers planning a business trip to Chicago or connecting to more than 120 one-stop destinations from Evansville via Chicago at aa.com. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson, and it's time for the Weekend Notebook. And it is a busy weekend in the Tri-State, lots of events going on. Let's start with the Germania Manor Corps Volksfest. It continues today through Saturday night. You can celebrate German culture, food, and drink, i.e. beer, at the Historic Club on Fulton Avenue. Live music includes German and non-German tunes. The event also includes a Kids Corner Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to noon. The festival switches to 21 and over at 2 p.m. each day, and admission is $5 after 4 p.m. Again, that's the Germania Manor Corps Volksfest continuing today through Saturday night at the Historic Club on Fulton Avenue. Well, this is the first Friday of the month, so that means it's time for another Haney's Corner First Friday. That's happening from 5.30 to 9 p.m. this evening. The free family-friendly celebration features live music, food trucks, art, entertainment, and more. Again, Haney's Corner First Friday begins at 5.30. It goes until 9 this evening. There's also a First Friday celebration at nearby... uh, at the, at the nearby um, location there on Washington Avenue. The name is slipping my, my, my mind at the moment, but lots going on there in the Haney's Corner District on this first Friday. Uh, let's move on to tomorrow. Uh, that would be Saturday. We begin with a Henderson Farmer's Market. That continues uh, from 8 a.m. to noon on both Fridays and Saturdays at 381 Sam Ball Way. That's on the fairgrounds in Henderson. You'll find local produce, meat, homegrown flowers, baked goods, and more every Friday and Saturday through October from 8 a.m. to noon. Again, that's the Henderson Farmer's Market at 381 Sam Ball Way at the fairgrounds in Henderson. Here in Evansville, well, we have an Evansville Farmer's Market. That's happening from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday. This event happens at 815 John Street. The free event features local vendors and food trucks. Again, all kinds of local produce produce you can find there. That's the Evansville Farmer's Market from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 815 John Street here in Evansville. And it's also another Saturday for the Franklin Street Bazaar. That happens from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on West Franklin Street here in Evansville. This free weekly market on the lawn of the EVPL West Branch 
offers local farmers uh, produce. Uh, you'll, you'll find uh, local farmers, producers, bakers, artists, and food trucks. Again, the Franklin Street Bazaar runs from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Saturday on West Franklin Street. That is a free event. Also happening on your Saturday, it's the EVPL Foundation Summer Book Sale. That's happening Saturday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Sunday from noon to 3 p.m. at Washington Square Mall. Uh, Do you have enough uh, books, CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays on your shelf? I didn't think so. Well, you can certainly add to your collection at the annual book sale with prices ranging from 50 cents to just $2. Again, that's the EVPL Foundation Summer Book Sale. It's Saturday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Sunday from noon to 3 p.m. at Washington Square Mall on South Green River Road here in Evansville. Also happening Saturday, it's Jim Brewer at the Victory. The uh, comedian Jim Brewer is bringing his Survival with Laughter comedy tour to Evansville. Tickets range from $26 to $56. Again, that's Jim Brewer at the Victory. That show begins at 6.30 Saturday night at the Victory. Also happening on your Saturday, it's another Dinner on the Bridge at Old National Events Plaza. That's happening at at 7 p.m. Saturday. The latest Dinner on the Bridge is being touted as a craft beer dinner. Tickets are $75, and reservations can be made at oldnationaleventsplaza.com slash events. Well, if you have an event that you'd like to hear us or like to hear on the, uh, on the Weekend Notebook, please drop me a line at jgibson, that's the letter J-G-I-B-S-O-N, at WNIN.org, and we will do our best to get your event on the Weekend Notebook here on the Friday Wrap. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who uh, was on today's show, including John Martin of Evansville Living and Evansville Business. A thanks to WNIN's Tim Jagalow. Also, a big chance, a big thanks rather to uh, Indiana Public Broadcasting's Abigail Ruman for her contribution. A big thanks to Jevin Redman for engineering today's show. Also, thanks to Mariah Winnie of WNIN for social media support. A big thanks to Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations, which help make the Friday Wrap a possibility. And, of course, your support, very important to bring the Friday Wrap on the air here at WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. I hope you have a fine, fine weekend. Uh, Looks like the weather is going to clear up. Uh, One other event we could mention uh, for the weekend notebook, the Evansville Otters are in town. They have uh, games tonight, Saturday night, and Sunday evening at Bossy Field. Uh, They're playing New Jersey this weekend. So, again, lots of things happening this weekend in the Evansville area. Hope you can get out and enjoy some of these events. I'm John Gibson, and for this Friday, that's a wrap.